Okay, we are now recording. Welcome everybody. So remote participants, I know you can't see the room. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people plus me in the room. And then there are other people on Zoom. So welcome to Check It Out, Exploring Careers in Libraries. So this program was created by Musselman Library and the Office of Multicultural Engagement. And I would like to thank Monique Gore, Clara Ramnath, Megan Smith, Michelle Williams, and Amna Zhigic for their thoughtful work that led to tonight's event. I should also point out that in that group, most of those amazing women are Gettysburg alumna. Sadly, I am not one of the club. Uh, our goal tonight is two, it's me and Michelle, everybody else is. Our goal tonight is twofold. Uh, first, we hope to spark some undergraduate interest in librarianship and archives work as potential career paths. And speaking for myself, I really didn't consider becoming a librarian until I was in a very unfulfilling graduate program in another field. And I like to think I found my path a little bit earlier if I had opportunities to work in the library as a student. I gathered a panel of alumni who have done just that, and you'll hear from them soon. Our second goal for this evening is to share information with you about Musselman Library's newest internship. So the Holly Internship for Current Students is, let me get the slide going here. Uh-oh, not working. Why isn't it going? There we go. The Holly Internship for Current Students is a one semester paid internship designed to help students learn more about what a 21st century career in academics libraries is really like. And we've designed it as a rotation that exposes students to work in all five departments of our library. There will be hands-on projects, group experiences, and a flexible component that can be tailored to each of our interns' interests. We're planning to hire three to four students this fall for an internship experience that will be in the spring 2022 semester. The interns will work six to eight hours a week and the pay rate is $10 an hour. And applications are open now in Handshake and they will be open through October 31st. I'm happy to take some questions about that at the end if anybody's interested, but I really wanna to get to our panelists for the evening. So we invited five alumni, let me stop this share. We invited five alumni. Let's see. So how do I show this best for the in-house? That's fine. Do, are I think you pinned the person? So I pinned all the people I want to pin, but should I get rid of these people? <laughs> do I do that? Yeah, that's yeah. better, right? <laughs> that's better. Okay. So um, we invited five alumni who worked in Musselman Library as a student and or went on to a professional career in libraries or archives. And I'm gonna introduce them in reverse chronological order. So first on that list is Malachi Dixon Powell in the upper right corner of our screen. He's the most recent graduate of Gettysburg, earning his degree in religious studies in 2021. He's passionate about human rights issues, which have fueled his interest in learning about religious social dynamics within global cultures. During his time at Gettysburg, Malachi was both a resident assistant and a community advisor in Paul Hall. I saw a little bit of excitement about Paul Hall over here, Malachi. Um, he also worked at Musselman for three years, starting in the stats department and eventually becoming a student supervisor for the user services department. And over just this past summer, Malachi was the Diane Worley Smith intern in special collections, where he assisted library staff in creating collections for student research. He's currently spending his time traveling and reconnecting with friends, but plans to pursue a graduate degree in library science and information management. So it's nice to see you again, Malachi. Next up, we have Lauren Ashley Bradford. Give us a wave, Lauren, also known as Lala by her friends. And Lauren graduated in 2018 with a degree in German studies and history. While she was a student, she worked as a book conservator in special collections and college archives. And the year after she graduated, she stayed on campus as the Holly intern, where she worked in each department of the library. I have to point out that was a previous incarnation of the Holly internship that was designed for a recent college graduate. So the thing that we're hiring for now is pretty different. She went on to earn a master's degree in European history, politics, and society at Columbia University, where her thesis research was on displaced persons camps in Berlin during the Second World War 
the post Second World War period. And Lauren is currently a second year PhD student at the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, doing research on violent women in Nazi Germany and Jim Crow America. That sounds super interesting, Lauren. Okay, next up, we have Kyra McFadden. Give everyone a wave, Kyra. She is a member of the class of 2016, but actually matriculated a little early in December 2015 with a degree in psychology. She went on to earn a master's of education in counseling and human services at Lehigh University. While here at Gettysburg, Kyra worked in Musselman Library as a peer research mentor while juggling five other jobs. Kyra was really busy here. And she's continued using her research skills as a master's level clinician specializing in working with women of color, anger and aggression in young males with autism, and people working through transgenerational trauma. She started not one, but two businesses during the pandemic, Kindly Beaded, which sells handmade bracelets, and the EP Project, a women's healing initiative geared toward helping women heal, feel, and emote by way of primary emotion validation through individual and group coaching. Kyra is dedicated to ongoing research that will help in breaking the stigma of mental health in black and brown communities, and does so through her job, sorority, and church environments. Kyra resides in Allentown, Pennsylvania with her spunky four-year-old daughter. Nice to see you, Kyra. Okay, next is Crystal Thomas. Give us a wave. She graduated in 2007 with a degree in English and Women's Studies. That's what we called it back then for our students. She went on to earn her MSI, which is a Master's of Science in, in Information in Archives and Records Management from the University of Michigan in 2009. Today, she's the Digital Archivist at Florida State University Libraries, where her work is a mix of digital project creation and management, supervision of the Digital Library Center, web archiving, digital preservation, and acting as a consultant for digital archiving projects on campus and in the community. And last but definitely not least, Jessica Garner graduated in 2006 with a degree in English and secondary education. She earned an MS in Library and Information Science from Simmons University and has worked in a range of library environments, including public libraries, academic libraries, and even the Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. Her current role is Special Collections Librarian and Archivist at the Assistant Professor Rank at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, where she manages special collections and archives while staying involved in reference work and information literacy instruction. Lincoln University is a public, historically Black university in Chester County, Pennsylvania. Welcome to all of our panelists. It's so lovely to see you all and together. So we're going to jump right into the panel questions. So audience, we have five questions, and the panelists have seen these in advance, so no surprises. And I think we'll be kind of informal about this. So I'll ask a question and whoever feels moved to begin answering, let's just do it that way instead of going down the line. We wanna make sure we get through five questions and still have some time for our participants to ask questions. So um, we'll just kind of keep an eye on the clock and see how it goes. Does that sound okay? Okay, so the first question, this is an easy one, I think. What made you interested in working in a library? Who wants to start? Remember to unmute. Okay, Malachi, then Lauren. Uh, sorry, Lauren. Um, so yeah, I remember my sophomore year is when I first applied to work at uh, Muscleman. And initially I just did it because I needed to find work. You know, I was a broke college student. Um, so I didn't necessarily see anything significant coming from that. Um, but being in a professional environment where you have so much support and so much information, it really just started to spark my interest in working in a library type community. Um, and I really solidified that I wanted to pursue that as a professional career over the summer when I was working in the special collections and archives department. And I really got to fully immerse myself in um, the library work experience. Obviously that was one specific department of the library, um, but getting that taste of what it was like to do that on a day-to-day -day basis really inspired me to want to pursue this as a profession, so. Thank you, Lauren. 
Um, mine started before Gettysburg and it's really tied with my um, current scholarship and research on the Holocaust. Um, when I was about 10, a librarian had introduced me to the Diary of Anne Frank and from then on kind of I immersed myself in the world of libraries and the Holocaust. Um, and so when I was a first year at Gettysburg, I had seen an internship um, through special collections and having been a, a huge lover of libraries and archives you know, for history, um, I've always seen the two go hand in hand. Um, I applied and I was kind of told, oh, well, you know, we normally target um, students who are a little further along. However, would you like a job instead? And so from there, I, um, I worked as a, a book conservator, as you have said, um, for all three years, sophomore to senior, and it only grew from there. Um, as you said, I also got to do the different version of the Holly internship where I worked in the library for a year. And that is just, I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed. I love libraries uh, and archives. So I, I kind of always connected my work and my research with libraries. Very cool. Anyone else want to respond to that one? I can go next, um, okay. mainly because I was not as quick on the uptake. <laughs> um, it took me a long time to figure out that libraries was a good fit for me. I went to Gettysburg thinking I was going to be an English teacher, and I didn't even last one education class. I did not. It did not fit. It's kind of ironic. I do a lot of instruction for special collections now. Um, so I drifted for a while, and then I was lucky enough in you'll ignore the cat for a second. Um, I was lucky enough uh, to go and study abroad in Bath and they kept taking us to libraries and archives for my classes. And one day it dawned on me, people were getting paid to work in those spots. Um, and so when I returned to Gettysburg, uh, I still wasn't really, I had a campus job I really liked already. And so I wasn't quite sure how to get into working in the libraries too. And I was in the library because I was always a Muslim in. And I don't know, do they still have the like quarter sheet fly, um, plastic things that have flyers in them constantly on the tables in Muslim in, or is that super old school now? Um, oh, but anyway, COVID. <laughs> yeah, they, they would have like those little ads always on the tables about upcoming events and they were advertising for internships in Muslim in. So I applied um, for both one in reference services and, and one in special collections. And I was lucky enough to be offered both, but I chose special collections and that was how I got started. So I didn't start working in Muslim in until spring semester in my senior year at Gettysburg. Better late than never, Crystal. And your cat is super on brand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why don't I just jump into the next question? We'll just keep rolling, okay? Oh, oh sorry, were you unmuted, <laughs> I, I was talking and then realized I wasn't. Uh, oldest person here, don't want to say. <laughs> no, so um, I, I got into it very, very young. So um, I didn't have a lot of money growing up. And so I ended up in a lot of uh, break rooms and when my mom was working. And my favorite break room was the library because she worked in the library as a staff person. Um, just part-time putting books away, but that was kind of a safe space. So then um, I ended up, we, <laughs> this little native child from Oklahoma moved to the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, <laughs> in the mountains. And so, of course, there was a lot of teasing and things like that that went on. I was a little bit of a misfit. So I literally just sort of lived in the library um, throughout my youth. And then when I got to Gettysburg, um, I lived in the library again, but funnily enough, I never worked in the library <laughs> because they paid more over at the bullet hole. I don't even know if that's still a place. <laughs> so I was about to say, so I'm, I'm kind of like, feel bad. I never got to work there, but it definitely was formative um, because I thought I was going to be an English teacher as well for a while, but like possibly doing library along with it in the schools. And then I went to the archives and kind of fell in love with being able to work with really old books. So that was the impetus. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Kyra, you're unmuted. Did you wanna jump in? Maybe not, okay. 
So most of you worked in Musselman Library when you were a student here. And the question is, tell us what you did as a student, which actually most of you have already done. So Cairo, I'm going to give you the lead on this one. Okay, sorry. My like, I just had a a, a minor tech thing. I just had. Um, that's I just okay. So I guess like it, it does kind of piggyback off of what I would have said in um, number one because I started working in the library as a peer research mentor because I was a resident assistant and wanted to bridge that gap between like first years, kind of like not knowing where to go and not knowing you know what they wanted to do or you know just not being accustomed to the library setting yet um so i only worked in the library for about i want to say a year and a half because graduated early. yeah it was about a year and a half um but i really enjoyed myself and i actually got to work under clint so that was really really nice um but um, so I worked as a peer research mentor, um, and actually one of my outreach programs was using different study hours um, to let first years come um, and be able to talk to me if they had some research questions um, without having to go um, in the library. Um, and then so yeah, like I think that was like the coolest part was kind of being able to be tasked with that, have a um, having an outreach program to help and like see where um, you could take it. So it was cool. I wouldn't say it was like an overwhelming amount of people, but it was nice to have students just come or like even when I would see my residents or other residents come in and I could just kind of be like, hey, and like usually the question was, oh my God, you work here too? And I was like, yeah, um, but it, it was really nice. So like in addition to that, um, we got to do like different like tasks, um, learn more about, you know, the coding and how things are put away. Um, and I actually learned more as a junior than I did my first years because I'm like a big bookworm and I loved being in the library, but I also had a floor that I needed to be at. So it didn't always work. And like, I'm one of those people I'll read a book instead of write my paper, um, but I wrote them, they got done. In timely fashion too um but uh so i learned like more about the resources just being able to navigate the systems learning how to you know be able to turn in a paper and kind of get feedback weeks before the different i don't know if they still have it, but the plan that kind of shows you like this is when you should have your thesis this is when you should start working on like some of your body paragraphs this is when you should start getting resources so um i was able to share a lot of that um so yeah, that was what I did in the library specifically, but I had like six, five other jobs that it, you know, I would plug, be like, hey, you could come to the front desk and see me. So it was nice. And then um, in that position, we also worked on the front desk as well. So you got to meet more of the staff that was there, but also be a lot more hands-on too with helping students and getting research, resources. Um, finding different books, finding different resources, being able to help them, you know, outsource through Iliad. So that's what I did. Yeah, I had a shift with Kyra at the reference desk, at least one of those semesters, and she knew everybody on campus. She was perfect for outreach in that way. Um, let's see. So we got everybody, right, on what you did as a student? I think we did. Okay, the next question is the juicy one. Are you ready? Okay, some of my colleagues and I were at a library conference a few years ago, and Roxanne Gay gave a keynote talk. And she got up on the stage, looked into the audience, and said, wow, there's a lot of white folks out here. And she's not wrong. The demographic data about the profession of librarianship support her observation, and our library at Gettysburg is really not any different. So we're curious uh, about what you would want to share about whether or how the lack of racial diversity in this profession impacts your experience working in libraries or using libraries. If you have any thoughts about that. Hey. So I would definitely say that while it was definitely a very welcoming environment, I think just on spot, that is definitely something that um, can deter students at first. Um, and so there were a lot of great opportunities. And I know one of the first year experiences is not the experiences, but I know like you, like you, you meet library staff um, during the first year orientation. Um, but I definitely think just being 
you know, a, a woman of color, a lot of times you, you're already going to an overwhelmingly white school, like it's a PWI. Um, and so there is a lot to say that sometimes representation is key um, in, in, in looking and being able to see yourself in those seats is definitely key. Um, so I think that even just having students and having a peer research mentoring um, program and like the Holly interns, I remember meeting some of the Holly interns, like seeing different people, seeing your classmates definitely is a great bridge to have um, because it's like the first step to seeing yourself um, in the in the setting and in the environment. So I think that, um, you know, as, as we started to um, increase in our years, um, and, you know, uh, matriculate to each grade level. I think I definitely saw more people, especially like from my year using the library resources. But I think um, at, at first sight, it definitely is something that's kind of just like, okay, like I don't kind of see myself anywhere. Um, or like, I don't know if I want to go and talk because like, what if, what if something I'm saying, like, how, how am I going to be perceived? So I do think that that is, um, I don't want to say unfortunately because I don't think it's unfortunate. I just think it's it's the reality. I think that's always a reality. Um, is is trying to see yourself represented, um, and that being a factor of why people may not come at first. Thanks. Anybody else want to take a crack at that one, Malachi? Yeah. Um, when I was working at Musselman, I was fortunate that I had a lot of fellow students of color who were working at the library with me. Um, so there was sort of a community there, but looking beyond just Musselman at libraries as an institution overall, I think um, while libraries are research hubs and information centers, you know, even prior to that, there are spaces where communities gather. When you walk into Musselman, you're gonna see students doing homework or talking. And as Kyra said, it's difficult when you walk into a space and you don't see anyone who looks like you. Um, and I think it's important that the professional staff reflects the community that we're trying to serve and the demographics that we're trying to serve. Um, and that space no longer necessarily can become safe when that's not you know the case so i think it's really important that we strive to push you know librarians of color and uplift black voices so that we can better serve all demographics because that's the main goal i think overall well said anybody else want to take a crack at that one um, so I would say most of my experience um, has been working as working in a lot of different libraries um, and archives and um, don't want to say it's kind of like a super spy situation because I am native but white presenting. And so working in a lot of those spaces and I would say definitely um, the larger or more prestigious the institution, the more very settled in kind of archaic ways of thinking, I'm going to be honest, um, happen. And it's it's just kind of, it, it catches me off guard still sometimes, though less because I'm, I'm not at a PWI anymore, which is, I'm happy about. Um, but, uh, and then kind of having to confront them and break down those pieces. So there's a lot of kind of extra work that I felt like I had to do going into, um, I, and I don't want to name names, but Harvard, <laughs> Harvard was a big one, uh, you know, and it's the law school. They're very traditional by like nature, but some of the ways they were even presenting things um, were problematic. Um, in particular with collections, one of the big issues I came across was the lack of even subject vocabulary um, to talk about blackness across the globe because I was working on British um, World War I internment camp documents and it had British black people. And I was like, the only term we have is African-American. They're not American. <laughs> and I'm just like, and I was like, I don't know what to do. And so, I, I mean, I think that those type of things just kind of continually happen. So that is definitely a hard thing. I think when you're first starting out in the field, it can be a little daunting, um, but yeah, it's still good. <laughs> I still love it, so. There's some great details. Thank you, Jessica. I can chime in a little. Coming yeah. from a Southern university that has much reckoning to do here. Um, 
Where do I want to start with this? You you mentioned language. And actually, one thing I'm really excited about that we're starting to do in special collections and archives here is we're doing a conscious editing initiative, which is actually based on a lot of the work Dorothy Berry is doing at Harvard. Harvard is getting a little better, or at least they're trying with their digital collections. Um, but while we're starting that kind of initiative and also understanding I'm a very typical white lady in a very white profession, I also need to be cognizant that I'm not placing a burden on the few diverse staff we have managed to recruit and retain at FSU. Because I'm, I'm gonna be honest, it is a shifting culture that we are working very hard, but I never want to hire someone and bring them into an environment that they don't feel unsafe or, un, or not welcome in. Um, and it is an, an uphill battle. Um, but I think we are doing the work, we're gonna continue to do the work and it unfortunately often does fall to the people of color who are coming into the profession to, to do a lot of that work. And so coming at it from my perspective, I'm just trying to be an ally and to sit down and listen and give people voice where they need to and advocate where I can. Um, and it is like, I've been in this profession for over 10 years now, which is a little scary to say out loud. Um, and it has, change and it's still changing and i think we are getting somewhere but it is definitely a, a lot of work still left to do and you know if, if it is a profession you go into it'll be work that you get to join and it is really exciting and interesting work um, but it can also be exhausting and you're just trying to be aware that you you have to do that work as well as everyone around you and getting that kind of buy-in is never easy in any level in any institution ever. So, um, but I think we're getting somewhere. <laughs> Thanks, Crystal. Um, I feel like since I'm going last, I, I mean, I support what everyone said. I don't really have that much to add aside from um, as someone who's not currently working in a library, just saying that like, it's not just libraries, right? It's like higher academics. It's a lot of things. Um, but <laughs> as I'm um, going to a PWI now, um, yeah, as, as everyone has already said, there's a lot of work to do, a lot um, uh, going forward that we all have to do. Uh, but snaps to what everyone's already said. I have nothing else to, <laughs> to add. Yeah, we do have a lot of work to do. Um, and I think there are a lot of people committed to doing it. That's the good news. Okay, next question. Can you talk about any connections between your current job duties and your experience working in libraries like as a, as a student? Like, was there anything that you learned in your student jobs, those of you who had them, that actually help you in whatever you're doing today? Is there a connection to be drawn? So I'm gonna jump in and say that I know I didn't work in a library, so this is possibly not that helpful, but I would say that no matter what job you have, there are always skill sets that you're gonna be able to apply. So right off the top of my head, I was like customer service. <laughs> so, I mean, my one of my first jobs in a public library, I had to deal with a small child that was trying to bite me. And I'm just going, I don't know that they didn't prepare me for this in school. <laughs> but, you know, thankfully, I had nieces and nephews and like, you know, I, I got through it. But I think that just kind of being able to say, you know what, a lot of things are applicable in the job that you don't think would be applicable. So, you know, all those life experiences are good things. Example. I would say even the idea of seeing somebody like freak out of doing something last minute and kind of being that resource. So like I did it as an intensive case manager. I did it to myself being in graduate school and even now being a clinician, even though I'm not in the library, it's all about finding resources, all about trying to help, you know, bridge those gaps. You see somebody kind of like, you know, I think I kind of almost think in terms of planning a paper when I see someone I'm like, all right, like we have this thing to work on. Like, this is the goal. How do we start going there? Like, let's make like a one week plan. Let's make like a, a two week plan. Um, and so, so having, having that skill set is really helpful. Um, and finding those resources are, are really helpful and just kind of like, 
you know, I think a library is like that safe space, like everybody can be here and kind of using that same sentiment and using it to fuel the work. And I think also in light of the very obvious pandemic that we are going through, a lot of it was, um, I'm like the person who loves to speak to health insurance about why equity is more favorable than access. I mean, equality. And so I'm like, yes, yeah, statistics show um, so like having that, I, that ability to go back and be like, this is a credible source. And, you know, if we want to move towards equity, you're not being very equitable right now. So I have found it very appealing when I'm using my, my argumentative skills to, to press forward, to really be more equitable overall. So it's definitely, I think everything that was applicable there is definitely applicable, even I, I would say as a mental health therapist. <laughs> another helping profession. Great. Anybody else? I guess mine's a bit more obvious in the sense that right now all I'm doing is a bunch of research. Um, and it, it doesn't quite connect to my time as a student, more my time as the Holly intern. Um, honestly, every department of the library, um, I was able to gain some skill that I'm now benefiting from. One of the first things that really came to mind was just being organized, knowing how to organize something um, and, and work through a process. And, and even down to helping my friend, I have so many colleagues who, who don't quite understand the Library of Congress call number system. And I'm like, oh, I'm on it. Like, I will help you find any book. Like, you need this resource. I will find it for you. Um, so I've found that as I've gone from school to school, I am like, I always say, I will be your personal librarian. Like, let's talk about what you're researching. Um, so yeah, I, I also am going to plug if there's any students listening, I highly encourage you apply for the um, new version of the Holly internship. It sounds incredible. And it's great that it's allowing um, current students a, a shortened version so you can really get in there and have a similar experience to mine, but, but actually do it while at Gettysburg and not having to live um, in Gettysburg for an additional year. Um, it's fantastic. Clearly, it's going to reach so many more students. And it was amazing and life changing. And I learned so much about libraries that I would have never known, like the fact that subject librarians exist. And that's something that I'm actually full on thinking of doing and getting my MLIS after this um, still. So apply for sure. It will change your life. I'm hiring you to be my marketing person. Laura. That was great. <laughs> Okay, last question. Okay, last question is, if you could give advice to your past self as a college student, what would it be? And this could be library related advice, advice or job related advice. But if you could know then what you know now, what would it be? So I think mine would definitely be try harder to work at the library. <laughs> so early on, um, <clears throat> because I think it really does kind of, once you can see the different parts of the library and be in the different parts of the library, you definitely get a feeling for what you may be interested in doing in grad school. And I'm a big proponent of try out the thing before going to grad school if possible, <laughs> just because, you know, it's like, it's not for everybody and not that, um, you know, the skills are totally applicable, but get those experiences when, you know, your housing's paid for and you don't have to do an unpaid internship or a really low paying sort of entry level position, um, staff position. So definitely do the internships when you can. Malachi. Yeah, just jumping off of that. Um, it would definitely definitely be not to sell yourself short. I remember when I was first told about the Smith internship that I did over the past summer. Um, I sort of doubted myself before applying. I was like, I don't know if this is something that I could even get. Um, but you know, I mustered up the confidence to actually apply, and that internship is the reason why I want to pursue. You know, a library. Uh, librarianship as a professional career. So don't like limit yourself. Like if there's an opportunity that you think that could fit into something that you want to seek as a profession, definitely go for it. Don't sell yourself short. Don't listen to the doubts that you may have, you know, go for it. And cause you don't know what path that could end up taking you on. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
So. Mine is not, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Lauren. Go for it, go for it. Uh, mine wasn't library related, uh, but I think it would be more just like, take a breath, it'll all work out. I was like the person who kind of jumped in and wanted to like do everything, but that's just like my coping mechanism with stress. Um, but also like this idea that like I had to have it all like figured out in one day. Um, and so like, it's something that I say to clients now, just like take a breath, like it's whether you worry about it today or tomorrow, if the problem's there, it's still going to exist. So like, just take a breath, be brief through it um, and trust yourself. I think like it also ties into what, to what Malachi is saying, like, don't listen to the doubts that you have, like innately, the answer is within you. And so if you just like, take a breath, you're, it's all going to, to work out the way it's supposed to be. That's great advice for anybody, anytime. Um, mine is kind of similar to some of what's already been said, but it, it's two parts, which is um, say yes to new opportunities, even if it seems like something way out of your comfort zone. Like if you've never thought about libraries before, but someone's like, oh, apply for this internship, you, you, know, you could like it, go for it. I mean, what's the harm in applying? Um, practicing applications, always important. We're doing, we're filling out applications our whole life. Um, but the other is it's okay to not like something and also not be the best at something. Um, I know I definitely struggled that, with that as someone who's also like really pushed myself in life and trying to see things through to the end and um, being upset if I wasn't like, oh, like I crushed that or something like that. Um, but yeah, so to I, I agree with what Kyra said, take a breath um, and it's okay. And most of that all kind of dovetails with what I had. Um, the one slight difference is, I don't know if any of you relate, I had only ever really been good at school. And so I was terrified to leave any kind of school environment. So I like was so relieved that I liked my internship in special collections. I was like, okay, now I can just go to grad school. Like there's a, there's a path, there's a thing I can do. And looking back, I really wish I had actually taken some time between Gettysburg and graduate school and actually worked more in the field because library grad school is a little weird. I'm not going to lie to you. And it's really more of a profession that you need to learn by doing. And that's not to say you won't work during grad school and you won't be working in libraries and archives and museums the whole time. But I wish I'd had a couple of year or like a year or two between Gettysburg and Michigan to try out different areas of the library. Um, like not that I don't love the the work that I do, but I never really just got to sit at a surface desk and, and do that kind of work in a library. And so I feel like I missed out on getting to experience different areas that may have also been of interest to me because I was just so focused and so relieved to have a path that I didn't stop to look around to see oh maybe this maybe I should have taken a breath and you know thought for a minute and just been okay to try something that was totally fear inducing <laughs> so great thank you thank you what wonderful advice okay it looks like we have a good amount of time for questions and those could come from our in-person attendees or our zoom attendees so if you've got a question on Zoom, just put it in the chat and we, um, my lovely assistants will be watching that so we know if there are any. In the room, are there any questions? General questions for everyone or directed to a specific? Go ahead. Um, for working in a library, are most career paths, do they usually like require grad school? I'm not sure if the room camera picks that up. Could you hear the question? Okay, great. The camera is working. Okay, so do most career paths require a graduate degree? It's like, it, I can tell Jessica and Crystal have the strongest views on this. So one of you take it away. I'm gonna say, yes, kind of, which isn't a satisfactory really answer, I know. Um, so if you want to be a library with a big L, right, and um, kind of do the, the bigger level projects, eventually you do need to get the masters. However, um, I, I think Crystal actually had a great thing with 
you know, get some experience though is never a bad thing. And I would say actually in library school, it was about half and half, at least for us. Half of the people were coming kind of straight out of um, college or undergraduate, or maybe had taken a year off. And the other half, they were doing it as a second career. So librarianship is never something that has to be sort of jumped into. So yeah, getting those experiences ahead of time to see if you like it, because you know it can be very different than what you kind of expect it to be. So um, I don't know if that was a good answer, but <laughs> short answer, yes, mostly. <laughs> and I will just say that the master's degree often gets your foot in the door um, that's it's it, and that's true for a lot of careers. It's not just librarianship, um, but it's your experience that will actually get you a job in the end. Um, but I have strong feelings for this because we went through about five years ago at Florida State. Um, we changed our policy so that we can hire someone in a library track who does not have a master's degree in library science. Um, so our rare books librarian is getting her is has her master's in English literature. She's currently working on getting her PhD in medieval literature, um, but she has no plans to to get her um, library degree at this time. And we were very excited to make that change um, because one it. it it broadens the it broadens the pool of people who can apply, um, and I think you get a lot more interesting applicants. People who who come in with no preconceptions in some ways, which, as we noted, libraries can be a bit stuck in our ways. We're we're a little staid. We can be a little um, slow to change, and so bringing in people that don't necessarily have the really strict library background or degree. I think has been rewarding to FSU. And so I'm hoping more institutions might join that um, decision because I, I think it's a, a good direction for libraries. So Crystal, just to clarify, that change in your policy was a master's degree in something still needed, even if it didn't have to be the library degree? I believe you still have to have a master's degree in something to be hired for a librarian position. Now yeah. we do have, um, staff positions that are doing excellent and great work. Like um, my studio manager in our digital production studio is a very high level staff member and not a faculty member. Um, so it's not to say that you can't work in libraries or have a fulfilling career in them without that degree. And I would just jump in real quick and say IT. IT is a really quick way to, <laughs> you want to get a position in a library that's not a librarian position, IT is kind of the way in because, I mean, we have quite a few people that work adjacent to our library that are IT. That's a great tip, Jessica. Yeah, so um, I would just add to that, ask, the, ask your people, like, come to the library and ask, ask us, um, what are the hardest jobs to hire? What skills are you looking for? And that might inform, I mean, if, if, you're, if your number one goal is I wanna get a job that pays me money, that's a good strategy, right? Um, it can't be anyway. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Okay. Do we have another question? Go ahead, Deirdre. I think I'm still like trying to like form my own question in like my head, but like I've heard a lot about like as like things become like more digital and like there's more of a focus on like online stuff and virtual stuff and like stuff moving from like people working to like more like machines. Like I guess more of my question and like even just like physical books to like ebooks, like what do you think like the future of librarianship might look like? Like because of that? That makes any sense? I can clarify if you need That's to. a big question. So great question. Are you, are you, um, I'm thinking about all those articles with those clickbaity titles, like the robots are taking our jobs. <laughs> Is that the context? Yeah. Okay. So how much are the robots taking the library jobs? Which jobs? Will, will there still be books? Anyone? I mean, Crystal's well, job title is digital. <laughs> I was like, I'm just gonna let her go first. Um, no, I don't want to like monopolize. I have uh, no. very decided opinions about this question, but I'm gonna let everyone else go. <laughs> I don't think the books are going away. Um, I don't know. I have not seen any slowdown in getting boxes of 
random materials from basements and attics from alums that we love very much. <laughs> I don't foresee that kind of going away anytime soon, really. Um, but it is definitely more of a digital world because that's the way researchers want to get their information, at least in my experience. Um, so yeah, you, you definitely need the tech skills, but I don't know that we're to the point where it's all automated quite yet, definitely. Did anyone else want to go? Or Crystal? No, it's all right. It's it's literally I get asked that question all the time. Like, when are you just going to digitize all the books? And I always have to come back and and very try and look sad about this, but be like, not all of them are worth digitizing. Like, it's it's a waste of time <laughs> to digitize them all. Um, but there's also this aspect, and I think a lot of us have either worked in special collections or work with archival collections. Um, and I, I lecture about this, so I'll try not to go down too deep a rabbit hole, but we can't recreate certain things online in a meaningful way for researchers and, and users to really get to interact with materials. And so there will always be, at least as long as I can have something to say about it, there will always be books in our library. Um, and particularly with you know the rare books and archival collections that I particularly work with, um, you know those are, are things that it's not like we digitize them and throw them out. Even though some faculty have definitely thought that that was what we were doing at times. Um, so there's always this aspect of education of making folks understand like where the advantages of digital are, but also where the disadvantages are, um, and just understanding that. I don't even have enough people if I wanted to digitize all of the books just in special collections and archives to digitize it and then describe it well enough where you could actually accurately refine it somewhere online. Um, you know, faculty don't always understand that users don't always understand that they they think I digitize something and it just magically appears online for them to find it. And it's it's constantly discussing like there's actually a lot of work involved in that and so. yeah. It, the books aren't going anywhere um and i even as the digital archivist i still work with the physical materials a lot getting them ready for digitization but also we've looked at things and said you know this isn't something we can accurately portray online so someone needs to come and see it we can't digitize it for them i just have one thought to add to all of those great answers which when i think about the idea of the robots taking the jobs you know, I've been in this field for nearly 25 years, and the robots are doing some of the jobs that people used to do in my early years in the career. Um, nobody checks in journals anymore. Print magazines and journals used to come in the mail and get stamped and organized and put on shelves, and now they just appear in the ether. Um, there are a lot of things like that that don't happen anymore. But in my experience, most of the jobs that have kind of gone away are the lower level hourly paid jobs. What we have a, an endless need for is, um, is people working at higher levels, uh, deciding what to digitize, how to digitize it, how to organize it so that it can be found, teaching researchers how to find it because the idea of the digital native turns out it's a big myth, right? You all know that? No such thing, really. Yeah, look at them all cringe. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not really worried about job security because we still need humans to mediate all this stuff. Okay, we had a question come in in the chat specifically directed at Kyra. Devin McKinney says, what did you learn about human psychology in the library? Great I was, question, I, Devin. Thank you. I was piping away at it. If you mean like in terms of like research, um, I would definitely say that there were some um, experiments and observations that went on in the library because it was just like one of the most incognito ways to do it. Um, and I'm a big proponent for like, if you need to search for something, EBSCO host with the psychology tab is your best friend. Um, but if you are meaning it in a way that I'm taking it with just like human behavior, um, I would say I definitely learned um, what kind of um, supported my own idea of like 
the, this idea that representation matters. Like it's something that we know even in just like we, we've talked about it earlier with one of the questions, but even just having a familiar face there. So I know it's a lot more of my residents coming to the desk if I was there, a lot more of my friends who would frequent the library but not really use the front desk, um, either coming to the front desk or even just asking me about like, hey, so who's a cool person to talk to at the desk? Or like, I need help with X, Y, and Z. Can you help me find it? And me being like, yeah, like that that's totally um, a, a thing that I can do. And so I think that um, I also noticed there was like, like you, you would hit that like, 11 p.m. to like 1 a.m. and it would be like a lot of people there because it was like pretty much just like student filled it was like dps there but like it was really student filled um and so i would go there sometimes and so if, if you're talking about um in that sense i definitely think that there is this idea of like you kind of go to your safe space and so you would see like everybody on the football team in one place especially like when it was like their night that they had to be in there then you would see like different organizations like different sororities would be there um I was I'm, I'm in a member I'm in a sorority so like our sorority was two people on campus but other people would um would, would still come. And so you kind of see like where everybody like wants to go, um, even in terms of like the, the floors, like we always had like this, like, all right, the people who are like more introverted probably going to go to like the quietest level. And you got the people who like don't mind playing around. They're going to be on like basement or first floor. So you really kind of see like it all, um, all play out. But I definitely um, noticed much more of an interest, especially from my friends who would use the library, but just asking about more resources um, as a result of working there. And then I have like a ton of other just commentary that goes on my head like, oh, okay, like, would this person be in a library if it like wasn't this person coming? So um, if you're asking in that way, I think um, you definitely start to see patterns and just like, you know, you, you, you'll you see very, con, um, the congealing of different groups um, in the library. Um, and like the people like, oh, like, you know, they're gonna sit at that that particular table. Like that's just like their table. So you definitely see this still play out even within the library setting. I hope I answered your question. Thanks, Kyra. We might have time for one more if somebody's got one last question. Now that Kyra, Devin's happy. Okay, I'm just going to open up the floor and ask if anybody, participant or panelist, has any final thoughts they want to share. Or, oh, I should also remind you, if you have questions about the, the new Holly internship for current students, I can take those too. And I just want to kind of also throw out there. Um, that if you are interested in it, a lot of libraries have internships. So even if you're thinking like you're going home during the summer and you would rather do something there, know that probably your historical society, your public library, your, you know, if you have a university near you, they probably have either internship or volunteer opportunities. So always look for those. And if you're close to Lincoln University, <laughs> We have internships too, and we would love to have people. So I have to throw that in there. I think it's required. Yeah, absolutely. That is fair game. Um, <laughs> and I'd like to think that the library field is getting a little bit better about um, paying interns rather than assuming that they'll work for free. I mean, mileage varies, but that's one thing that we made a commitment to at Musselman Library years ago, and we stick by it. We don't, we don't do unpaid labor. We just don't. Okay, well, I think we're going to wrap things up. Anything else, Clara or Michelle? We got everything on the checklist? Okay, getting a thumbs up over there. Okay, thank you all for coming so much. Panelists, I'll say a little bit more to you after we wrap up. Thank you so much. I hope you all apply for the internship. Encourage people you know. We're open until the end of October. 
October 31st, Halloween, which is a Sunday. So you got until 11.59 p.m. on Halloween. We're not going to look at anything till Monday morning, so why not leave it open? Um, and we are available to chat about that in advance if anybody's interested before you actually apply, okay? Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to turn off the recording now.